Welcome to DMG's Bootstraps in Business. I'm Savannah Jones with Stephen Hodges, and we've got the May preliminaries right around the corner. So we've been speaking to candidates for governor of Oregon about the path that our Oregon businesses have been on and the need for a new direction. So today we're speaking with former House Speaker, Democrat, Tina Kotek, and we're going to uh, get to some specifics here in a minute. But first, can you kind of tell us a little bit about who you are, um, how you ended up in Oregon, and then some of your background and experience here in Oregon? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Well, thank you, Savannah and Stephen, for the opportunity to be here. So I moved to Oregon in 1987. Um, I had dropped out of college and uh, not so much on a whim, but pretty close, moved to Eugene and you know, I've been on the West Coast ever since, and the bulk of that in, in Oregon, because I found a place where I could be myself. And really, I think what's great about the West is you have that ability to, you know, not be constrained by some things that, you know, are a little different on the East Coast. So, you know, being in Oregon um, really changed my life. I ended up going back to school, finishing at the University of Oregon, did my graduate work at the University of Washington. And uh, for the last 20 plus years, I have been in Oregon working as what I would say an advocate, someone who fights for people. 20 plus years ago, I got a job at Oregon Food Bank right out of graduate school. My job was to try to understand why Oregonians, so many Oregonians were coming in for emergency food. And it really was some very basic things. People were not earning enough. They were working hard, but not making enough money. People's housing was too expensive. A lot of people were in medical debt. This was pre-Obamacare, so a lot of people didn't have health insurance. And um, I've been working on those issues ever since. I think it's important to, you know, if there are systems or things in the way from people to keep people from being successful, we got to work on that. So um, I came into the legislature in 2007, and I've worked on everything from budget issues to uh, housing issues to human service issues, but also things that I think are just really good for business, making sure we have enough housing in the state, working with people who are unsheltered, but also just making sure we have a housing for everybody, particularly our, you know folks who work in Oregon. We've got a housing crisis, and I'm happy to talk about that. Um, and then I became Oregon Speaker in 2013, and I served as Oregon Speaker of the House for nine years. I never intended to be the longest serving speaker in our history, um, but there were a lot of things to do. And you know, the reason I'm running for governor is I want to make sure that all the things that I've worked on and the things that I think people need state government to do actually get followed through. Um, it's really important that people have the services that they pay for. It's really important to make sure that state government works well with everybody, including businesses, to make sure they have what they need. And it's a you can't just talk about these things. You have to be able to do the work. And, and my record as speaker says that I can work with everybody, get things done, and actually solve problems, and that's why I'm running for governor. Very good. Well, and and a lot of the people that are listeners are their business owners or uh, employees as well. That you know they're concerned. Um, there's a lot of talk right now of you know a recession um, that has been percolating. I think you had the head of Deutsche Bank come out and say we're we're going to see a major recession very soon, and it has got a lot of people worried. What would you what would you say uh, to those people? Your biggest strengths for Oregon businesses, jobs, uh, business creation. What would you say your biggest strength is for them? Yeah, it's a great question. Well, I think what's important for businesses, or at least what I'm I'm told, is consistency and stability. Um, I was a leader in the Oregon House during the Great Recession, mm -hmm. and those were very difficult years because so heavily dependent on income taxes that we saw just devastating cuts to state and local public services that were really important for, you know, everybody. And, you know, and we had a foreclosure crisis. So I think being able to lead through crisis is really important. Of course, this pandemic, uh, we didn't have a playbook for this, totally different situation. You know, when people are losing their jobs literally overnight, and the whole economy is shutting down, and then it pops back up, and then we have inflation. I think what people can, can count on for me as governor is including everybody in the conversation, making sure we have a plan, and being really transparent and communicative with Oregon voters and Oregon business leaders about what we need to do. People need to know where things are going. Look, if it's hard, at least you know 
there's there's a path or you can get to stability because I think the biggest challenge of a recession is is the unpredictability and the pandemic has been unpredictable for people and business owners in particular and business uh, you know employers have just been like you know every day is a new adventure right what I can do as governor is be as clear and, as, and provide as much stability and certainty as I can, even if things are hard. And, and I've had experience doing that in the house. Uh, on that note, uh, I think you are known for holding difficult discussions uh, to get to a specific outcome uh, with that goal in mind, uh, having those discussions, making those decisions. Can you give us some examples of things that you have done in the past here to help businesses? Yeah, well, absolutely. I think one of the biggest things that I did during the pandemic to help businesses was to address what we were hearing around the fear about increased payroll taxes because of the effects on unemployment. So as you recall, people started losing their jobs because businesses could not stay open in the pandemic. And that impact of increased unemployment was going to have an immediate impact on the next uh, increase in payroll taxes for businesses just around the time they were trying to get back up and running. And what we did in the legislature that I was, I put legislators together, both Republicans and Democrats, and I said, we got to solve this. And so we had a pretty healthy unemployment benefits trust fund. We made some adjustments. And over the course of the decade, we're going to save businesses a lot of money to because we now have adjusted the payroll taxes. So they're not seeing a big hit because of the spikes in unemployment. And that is, you know, I've had a lot of business owners come up and say, thank you. It's like, I, everything is still challenging, but at least I know I'm not going to see this giant bill for unemployment that I had nothing to do with. And that was very, very important, particularly for our small businesses who just, you know, their margins aren't that big. And having a substantial increase if you're a restaurant owner was going to be a really big deal. And so I worked on that. Um, but I think in terms of making hard choices, I think he, at some point you have to make decisions. And my philosophy has always been, let's put people together to get to yes. How do we solve a problem? Instead of starting off with, well, that's a no, we can't do that. I think there's always an opportunity to make improvement. I, I never think the status quo is sufficient. There's always room for improvement. Um, I think the increase in the minimum wage is a good example. I certainly came in in the 2015 session saying, look, we need to get people higher wages. It's going to be good for the economy. It's good for people's you know, self-sufficiency. But there was a lot of pushback that this wasn't going to work all over the state. So instead of trying to really push through something that would have you know, been the same minimum wage across the state, we negotiated a, a deal the following session in 2016 where there was a regionalized approach, a phased-in approach for minimum wage increases around the state. And it, and it worked. And it has been working. Uh, prior to the pandemic, we saw wages increase, we saw productivity increase, we saw people's um, discretionary income increase. Um, so, but we did it in a thoughtful way that addressed the different needs of the state. And that's the kind of approach that people are going to be able to expect from me as governor. There's no simple answer to complex problems, but at some point you do need to make a decision and move on. Absolutely. Um, what would you say, like, you know, the biggest challenge for if you were elected governor? You're going to come in and just strictly speaking about businesses. I know there's a lot of other issues out there, but just for businesses, what, you know, what we're seeing, you come through the pandemic as a business owner, that was scary. I'm a business owner, uh, eyes wide open. And then now we may be going into a recession at some point. Who knows if that prediction is right, but the fear is there. What are your thoughts of the, uh, what's going to be the biggest challenge? Yeah. Well, I think there are three things I can do as governor to support businesses. One, one of my top priorities will be housing. I think every corner of the state is having a housing supply problem. We're in a crisis. It's not just the, the immediate needs that we see on the streets of people who are unhoused, but it's folks who have pretty good jobs who can literally not find a place to live in the communities where they work. That is an economic challenge for our state. It's a challenge for employers. If we want to bring, you know, or, or expand businesses in our state, where are people going to live when they work in, in a community? So I, and we hear from our economic forecasters all the time that the lack of housing of all kinds, particularly workforce, workforce housing is a really big issue for employers. So I'm going to be working on housing and I'm going to need a lot of help from the private sector to figure out how to do that. So I think that working on that challenge that affects everyone, including our employers is a number one priority. 
I think the second issue is workforce. We are seeing the changes in the workforce that the, in some ways, the pandemic has pushed forward. And you get a lot of people who don't want to go back to what they were doing before. And there are a lot of sectors who need employees. So really supporting what the governor did um, during this legislative session with new investments in our workforce system is going to be incredibly important. Helping our, you know, helping employers who have in-house training programs to connect them with students or people who are reskilling. You know, people in their mid-20s are like, I need a new job. How do I connect with employers? I also want to support our community colleges. We expect our community colleges to be that place where people can go and say, I need that certificate, I'm changing jobs, or this employer needs X, Y, Z. Our community colleges are not well supported in the state. That is going to be probably of all the education items, a top priority for me, because we can invest in career and technical education in our schools, which we should. But then if someone needs some additional skills and the community colleges aren't there, that's going to affect everyone. That's a workforce challenge for our employers. And then I think the last thing is, is really how does state government function for employers and businesses. What I hear and what I've heard over the years is when somebody wants to expand or you know change their facility, it takes far too long to get the permits you need or get through the regulatory hoops to make it happen. Look, those regulations are in place for good reasons, but it should not take literally years to get a new water permit or an air permit or whatever. I mean, like, let's follow the rules. We got to do it quicker because businesses know time is money. And if you're trying to make an investment, if it takes way too long to get a permit, you're going to walk away from the investment. And I think the state can say, that's not okay. We got to make sure you can get through the paperwork quickly and effectively so you can go back to doing what you need to do. Yeah, I, I, I smile because I'm uh, doing a remodel and it took me two and a half years to get permitted. Uh, it, it, it was very frustrating, but... I mean, obviously not your fault. I get it, but I'm just saying, you know, in case, you know, when you win, if you win, you, you know what I mean? I, I'm just, you know, just trying to grease. I'm telling everybody, just want to grease the wheels. No. Um, following that up, you, you know, you mentioned the community colleges. Would that include the trade programs? I mean, right now, you know, before the pandemic, we had a, a you know, the trades were, were really low. Nobody was going into them. They, uh, you know, how do you promote that uh, uh, for for more young people to look at the trades? Because, you know, we talk about student loan debt and, and all that. It's like hmm, my oldest 22-year-old uh, kid. I said, well, why wouldn't you go into the trade? I mean, you can get paid, while, you know, if you want. And it's exactly what he did. He's in the trade program right now, loves it. And so I ask you, you know, wh- how do we address the, the lack of people coming into the trade program for these businesses that are, I mean, some of my clients particularly, they're saying we we can't find them. We don't, I mean, they're just not coming in. What do you say? Well, um, I'm so excited about that topic because for, for young people who have the aptitude and interest, we have to provide options. Look, the college pathway works for some people, but not everybody. And I was just in Beaverton school district yesterday. I visited their, uh, construction trades program. I visited their auto shop program, their auto mechanic program, and I'm a huge fan of pre-apprenticeship programs, programs in schools uh, or for people right out of high school who say, here are the things you need to know about getting into the trades. You get a you get an idea of what it's like. You get a sense of what the job site is like. And then you're like, oh, and now I know about, well, I could go into this apprentice program, whether I'm an electrician or a plumber. Those are great programs. You get paid to be in the programs. You, you finish a program four or five years, have no debt. You're already working. Um, those are incredible programs. And we're going to need a new construction workforce. We're going to need, and I don't think it's just about construction. I've been excited about some of the apprenticeship programs and pre-apprenticeship conversations about getting people to be CNAs and building a professional pipeline for folks who want to be in the care economy. That is, and we have to create those things. They're there. We want to support them and then get students into them. And I, that's why I've been a big fan of fully funding career and technical education in our high schools. That hands-on learning is like transformative for students. And it is a workforce thing. It is a workforce need that we, you know, if we're going to build a lot more homes in this state, guess what we don't have? A construction workforce that can build a lot more hope. So this is like just a true opportunity for us to really encourage people getting into different types of technical and trade skills and employers need those, those workers. It's a, it's a great moment for us to really push that. 
Um, speaking of a great moment, it's 2022. We've come down a windy path with the pandemic and everything over the last two, three, four years. You know, the pandemic was only a couple, two and a half years, whatever. But everybody is clamoring for change. 2022, do you hear this? Is this what you hear? We want a new direction. Is that something that you're hearing? What is that? What I'm hearing, yeah. I'm hearing frustration. You know, I'm hearing people like, we've been through a lot. And whatever that looks like in your personal life, we're all reassessing. We spend a lot of time in our homes thinking about what we're doing with our lives. And people aren't happy. They want things to be better. They want things to be different. And I am with them on that. When, as a legislator and as a legislative leader, I worked really hard to put important programs and policies in place and they haven't followed through, right? We don't, we don't have some of the things that we've promised people. One of the reasons I'm running for governor is to make sure that the bill that we passed to set up a paid family and medical leave insurance program in the state of Oregon gets off the ground and actually works for people. It is going to be so transformative for a program that says, hey, if you need to stay home, take care of your kid or an elderly parent, you're going to have some wage reimbursement so you can do that and stay afloat. I negotiated that bill. I'm frustrated it's delayed. I understand pandemic problems in the employment department, but the next governor has to make sure that gets off the ground, gets off the ground well, and and I want to make sure it happens because that is such a hugely important program, and I think will be a national model once it's up and running, and we just have to get it done. So as, as someone who's been in the legislature, you can pass all the bills you want, but if you don't implement them and don't follow through and actually provide good customer service, you're not fulfilling the, the complete deal. You got to get it all the way done. So that's where people are frustrated. They want things to work. Um, kind of along that topic, uh, we saw Intel, right, recently. They, they opened up in Ohio. And, you know, I maybe it's a football fan of me. I was like, oh, great, we lost to Ohio there. You know, as you know. But, I mean, in all seriousness, we just lost a ton of jobs to Ohio. And maybe I, I don't know. And I've to be fair, I've asked every candidate this. Tobias, I asked him. Um, every Republican candidate that we've had on, I've asked them. And the answers are very similar. And so I want to hear yours because I, I don't know that I've heard you get asked this question. What would you have done differently with Intel? And, and before you answer, I want to say to, to a lot of the people I know, it feels like we did nothing. Like we didn't talk to them. We didn't try to earn it or keep it. That is our, you know, we, we, we pay our employment uh, tax, right? It's our bread and butter to the state to build roads, bridges, everything, right? And that's how it feels. And I want to give you this opportunity because I want to make sure that people get to hear the answer because I think there may be, it may not be being told, right? Maybe we did talk to them. Um, what do you say to that? Well, I'm glad you're bringing it up. Uh, I, I don't know if Governor Brown spoke with the leaders at Intel. I was out there late last year before that decision about Ohio was announced. And what I heard from Intel leadership was they are 100% committed to Oregon, that they are invested in their research and development capacity, that they are continuing to expand on their footprint in Hillsborough for what what they can do on that site. And that's hugely important, not only the direct jobs as our largest private employer, but also all the indirect jobs and all, and I learned about how all the other companies that have grown up around Intel that provide services and, uh, and equipment for their fabs, very, very important. And we should have had a conversation about whether we could have the possibility of a larger manufacturing uh, facility like Ohio landed. I think it would have been hard because I have to say Ohio offered them a lot of money. I mean, a lot of money to come to Ohio and, and they had the land. I think we have the land, but we probably don't have, what we don't have right now is that sizable plot of land where the trained workforce is. You know, we're building a lot of interesting factories out of central Oregon, the, the data centers, and they're wonderful. They're great jobs to get, you know, for the construction and getting them running. But there aren't a lot of people who work there. But they're really big facilities. So how do you merit, you know, put together really large facilities that require a very skilled, large workforce? And we're just, we're not set up for that right now, but we need to figure that out. So I'm glad Senator Wyden is having that conversation. But there are other semiconductor 
you know, facilities in Oregon that are expanding. And bottom line, I agree 100% with Intel and our president and everybody else. We need to be able to make chips in the United States. We cannot cede that to China or other places. We have to be able to have that manufacturing capacity in our country. And I think because Intel is committed to R&D in Oregon, it will continue to be a leader in building, bringing in other types of manufacturers because of their presence. So I don't think it's a, we're never going to see an expansion. We just, we weren't prepared to have that large site come. We just weren't. So is it, is to double down on that, is that um, because of the urban growth boundary? I mean, that I, I personally I wonder, I, I, there's no education behind that. But when I look on a map, I'm, I've wondered, because I've heard that before, we don't really have the land where we need to. And then I look at a map, I'm like, well, is it because of the urban growth boundary? Right. Well, I do think our land use system, can, you know, it's there's a process that's different than other states. That doesn't mean we can't figure that out. Um, when Governor Kitzhaber was in office, in, in, I think in his third term, you know, we did have a bill for expedited siting for large industrial sites. So I don't know why that wasn't utilized. But again, I don't know if Intel had the conversation with Governor Brown. I, I don't know. I haven't. I haven't heard one way or the other. Well, what would you say? Do we have? And I, I, I mean this in all sincerity. And excuse my ignorance, but do we have a business development team in our government to bring businesses here? Because if we do, I feel like we don't talk about it enough. I have seen an evolution of Business Oregon, our business development department, to be more proactive. And I think there's more we can do there. And I think um, particularly by supporting certain sectors, uh, one of the things that I worked on right before I left the legislature was funding a series of studies that Business Oregon could do for sectors that need more support. Like, how do you plan for the future? Because I'm a big believer in if you don't know where you're going, you're not going to get there. You're going to go off track, right? And when I think about growing some of our sectors, um, some of them just have really never had that conversation about, well, where are we now? How are we competitive? What do we need to do differently? And that bill was particularly, I know this might sound strange, but we need to study about the cannabis industry. There will eventually be, you know, the ability to have legal cannabis across the country. And Oregon could be the place from an export perspective that has the best you know, quality product in the country because it already has a good reputation. We even haven't had that conversation about, are we ready for export? Are we ready to promote an industry that will, at the end of the day, probably employ a lot of people? So it's that kind of planning that I, I think we need to see more of from Business Oregon because that, I think, is where they haven't done a lot. Well, and, and to that point, I think, uh, you know, if it were to be federally dec- decriminalized, Oregon obviously could sell across state lines, open that up. But what I don't hear a lot of people talking about is hemp oil because hemp oil I've, I've done a lot of, you know, research on that. And it's, it's interesting. It could replace a lot of our plastics and it, it biodegrades hundred percent actually. So you don't have the massive, you know, land mass in the Pacific ocean of plastic. That is, I mean, which still to this day blows my mind that there is a landmass of floating garbage in the Pacific. Not necessarily, it's not necessarily just our fault. I mean, it's the world that, right. But it's like, I often wonder, it's like, well, here's a product that is oil that you could, and I don't know if you could mass produce it enough to replace 20%, 50%, whatever that is, but we should try. Right. We should definitely try. And I think that's the kind of investment startup capital that I'd like to see Oregon do more of. Um, I've been a big fan of growing our bioscience sector in Oregon. I think the growth of Genentech in Washington County and also in, you know, they have uh, some office um, support work in Portland. That's really important. Why should we, why should Oregon be behind Washington, California of growing a bioscience sector? We can do that. Um, Those are good jobs. That's manufacturing which we do really well out in Oregon. And so, again, I think it's having those targeted sector conversations. So it's just, I think when you sit down with like a giant group of business owners that are all over the map, it's very hard to focus. So I think you have to take a very like, okay, let's take this sector, let's bring the folks in that sector together and the universities and state and be like, what do we do to like take this to the next level? And I, I'd like to see that more, more proactive stance out of business Oregon. 
Well, something we haven't touched on uh, and uh, the state of where we are now, uh, homelessness and crime, uh, in particular downtown Portland, but also throughout the state. So where we are now, where do you see, as governor, <laughs> where do you see us going? Because we haven't been going in a, in a good direction up to this point. Yeah, people don't feel safe in downtown Portland. And look, all of Oregon is, it's not Portland, but the success in Portland is important for the economic success of the state. It's where people come to, there's you know vital tourism, it's our financial hub. There are a lot of reasons that downtown Portland needs to be higher functioning. And other cities across the country have been dealing with this. You know, when people left office buildings, created ghost towns in most major cities. We have to get people back to downtown Portland. We have to work more urgently to reduce, you know, trash on the streets, help people get into permanent housing. My housing plan specifically talks about how we can reduce houselessness, homelessness for very vulnerable Oregonians, I think, in the, you know, the next year or two. And I'm talking about our veterans. There's money for veterans right now to get housed. There shouldn't be a veteran on the street right now because there are resources there, right? So sometimes it's been a resource issue. I think it's a focus issue. So if we can get people um, from the streets into more transitional shelters like converted motels, manage villages, get folks stable, get them the supports they need, they'll get into housing. Um, we have to do that. Portland has to come back and and also just welcome back people to the downtown. And I, as governor, that's working directly with Mayor Wheeler and the other leaders in Portland and the metro area to make that happen. And I think my question is always, like, what do you need from the state? How can we be a good partner? I don't want to assume we can do it all, but there are tools and you can be a catalytic partner in the state to get things done. And Portland has to come back in terms of getting people downtown and working downtown. It's really important for the economy of the state. You know, with that, I, a little bit, you know, I'm going to bring up mental health um, because not everybody that is homeless is mentally ill. However, it is a, it, there is a, a, a good chunk of the mental health issue that is impacting that because if you're mentally ill, how are you going to get help? And how are you going to get a doctor's help? More importantly, you're probably more likely to self-medicate. We know that, right? And let me tell you a little bit of a story. Um, it'll be quick, uh, which blew my mind in the state of Oregon. And I understand it's like this basically in every state. Uh, a close friend uh, was going through a mental health crisis. We were trying to get him help. We had gone in uh, to uh, the court to get a judge to help with that. The judge said, I cannot help. And I'm going to butcher the law. I don't have a lawyer with me, and I, I'm not a lawyer. But uh, the, the quote was, you're talking to the wrong person. I'm like, I don't understand. He said, you should talk to the legislature. Because right now, if somebody is not a danger to themselves or others, it is not illegal to be, you know, mentally ill, which, okay, I, I get that. But on the same token, you know, and especially the Democrat Party, right? This is a party that prides, we are progressive. That law in itself seems really regressive in the fact that, okay, and this is why I said to the, to the judge, and it wasn't disrespectful, it was, so you mean to tell me before he goes to hurt himself or somebody else, that's when you can step in. And I, I, and I said, that seems a little late. And he goes, I, oh, I know. And nothing, it's never talked about. We talk about funding and, and putting money here, building this home there, but we don't talk about that. And I understand, what, my understanding, maybe you can correct me, is in the 1920s, I believe mental, uh, mental health laws were used as a political weapon. And, and so, which is terrible. But now we have this and we have no funding for mental health. So, I mean, I, I understand this is gonna take both right and left and independent. It will take all of us. But what could you do or do you have any desire to get that law changed so that when you are able to do all the great things that you were just talking about and getting that through, that actually it will have teeth and people can get help. Well, you're raising a very, 
good set of questions. Um, it is complex, and you got it right, um, particularly with the Americans with Disabilities Act. When you have a mental illness, you know that's a that's a disability, right? So you you have rights uh, and freedoms, and until you're a danger to yourself or others, it's very hard to require someone to you know be civilly committed to get help. My uh, wife is a social worker, and she's worked with folks who have very serious and persistent mental illnesses, and it's a very fine line of protecting, you know, um, people's rights and also getting help. And so one of the things that's important to me in my plan for helping folks who are unsheltered is we need more trained individuals to develop those relationships with people on the streets who are in either suffering from an addiction crisis or mental health crisis to build those relationships, to help them get stable enough to get into housing, because it is, you can't just commit people. I mean, you just, there, it was misused in the past, right? And I can understand the frustration where it seems like people aren't, we can't help people help themselves, right? But we have to protect their rights and freedoms. And so what it means is making sure we have people who can say, build that relationship, say, hey, how do I get you back on your meds? How do I get you into recovery if you're ready for, you know, for treatment for addiction? But you got to remember, I was just at a lunch day talking um, about folks who work in addiction treatment. This is a provider who serves, has 20% of the addiction treatment beds in the state. 80% of who they serve are on the Oregon health plan. So these are pretty low income Oregonians. We don't have enough treatment and we have almost the highest need in the country in terms of addiction issues and we are at the bottom in providing services. So it's, I think a judge, until we can show that we are providing more service and more opportunities for people to take care of themselves, it would be very difficult to then say, uh, okay, well, we're going to change the civil commitment laws, for example. Um, so it, it is, it is a very challenging legal situation. So until that gets fixed, we got to just get people services and, and, and get them connected. And here's my question from a layman, right? Um, couldn't we define a danger to oneself and others, right? Because, and, and maybe you don't have the answer to this, but when I, when I see somebody, I am not an attorney, but right. I'm guessing you can, but I, I right. yeah, I'm not sure. But, but when I look on you know, downtown Portland about a week ago, uh, maybe a little bit less, but there was a gentleman that, I mean, it was, it was heartbreaking. He's in the corner. He's shaking. Yep. He, you know, and it's, isn't that a danger to himself? I mean, right there. And, and I, you know, legally there's a different answer, right? And that, that is my question right there. Can we redefine what is a danger to somebody, you know, without stripping freedoms, right? Where, where is that gray line? I don't know if you would have the answer to that. Maybe you do. What it's worth, there have been conversations in the last few years about, you know, clarifying some of that and they are very complicated conversations and um, because it is hard to watch you don't want to see anyone hurting like that and you can see it you don't have to look very far to see people who are hurting on the streets um, and our legal system protects those individuals from being you know hospitalized against their will um so again, finding that balance. But there are there are there are folks who, when someone is in danger, because they're like exposure. If that person were out there shaking when it's ten below or something, they're obviously in danger, right? So it's it's super complicated. And at the end of the day, we're not where we need to be in providing those services. We're just not. Even and if we, we change, should be. I mean, we've we underfunded this system for many yeah. years. But I can tell you with Measure 110 money and the money from the legislature this past, this current biennium, there's a billion dollars more going into a very fragile system that we can improve upon. And when I, one of the reasons that's important for me to be governor is let's make sure that those dollars actually produce the change and the help that people need. And that takes oversight of the agency that's in charge of that money. And I can tell you what I am looking forward to is getting in the weeds and be like, tell me why it's not working. Why isn't that money? working? Why aren't we getting the services out? That's what people can expect from me. I'm going to be super annoying because I want to make sure this stuff works. Fair enough. Um, all right. Speaking of Oregon bringing in money, uh, uh, we're gonna we're gonna get into the fun questions here in a little bit, but before then, we're <laughs> okay. gonna uh, let's talk about the cat tax. Hey, Eddie, I mean, um, I have to say thank you for bringing up some very complicated topics. But yeah, I and, and so we're totally we, getting away from you know how it impacts business and 
that that happens on these because there's a someone lot someone having a mental health crisis on yeah. the street fixes. It's connected. So you're not yeah. yeah. Um and and so cat tax. Uh let's talk about that. I I you know, not my words. I don't need to, you know, again, if you become governor, I do not need an audit. Just saying. Uh no. But um it, it reads for the pr- privilege of doing business in Oregon. And then after 2020, of course, things haven't been rosy. I, I, I can say that. Um, and a lot of a lot of people have told me I don't understand where the privilege is coming from. And I, I found that to be interesting. So w- would you change? We had, to, and I'll be fair. You can you can watch. Tobias had had some changes that he would make. All of the Republican candidates so far that we've spoken to, same thing. I think you would probably under guess that. So would you make any changes to the cat tax? You know, I don't know. I, I never say never. So here's what I know about the corporate activities tax. Um, as we were, and from overall business taxes, fairly behind other states in providing, you know, adequate revenue to do essential services like our schools. Um, with the addition of the corporate activities tax, we've, We've stabilized our revenue system, so we're not so overly dependent on um, the income tax here. Um, and the corporate activities tax, my understanding, takes us to kind of in the middle of the pack, an overall business tax uh, impact. And um, it was carefully crafted to try to adjust for size of businesses. Um, and it, we modeled it after some other states. And what I'm seeing with the corporate activity tax revenue, it is dedicated to the Student Success Act, it's dedicated to education, it's dedicated to things that I think businesses care about, which is proving our graduation rates, fully funding career and technical education. It is trending in the direction that was projected. Um, now, like any new tax, and you see this up in Washington State, because they have, you know, they yeah. have their own, um, I forget their tax, but they adjust it, you know, from year to year. You know, I would assume over time, yeah. as we see how the corporate activity tax is working, that there will be adjustments. But I think people have to come in and justify why there should be adjustments, because it because when you make adjustments, i.e., maybe collect less money for this or that, it will impact our ability to fund pre K through twelve education in the state. So it's not a never, but I do think the way it was designed, even if you didn't totally agree with it, it's been collecting the revenue that's necessary to fund our schools. It's been it's, it's not up or down. I mean, it's really trending in what was projected. So I, that's an indicator to me. It's like, okay, maybe we got the, the basics right. There's always opportunities to make adjustments. But um, right now, I think we, we wanted to wait a couple of years to see it actually how it's working. So I assume over time, there'll be conversations about making adjustments. I just don't know what those would be at this time. So it, it, one of, uh, I don't remember which one, one of the candidates, uh, only one had said to us, Correct me if I'm wrong, but only one had said they'd get rid of it. Um, but most had said they would adjust it. Um, and I, I believe it was one of the Republican candidates that said we we put the decimal in the wrong spot because of the amount of money that was raised off of it. And I believe it was it was more than they had predicted, way more. The the budgeting office had that that was the claim. And so you know, that's why I asked that question, you know, is there that kind of ebb and flow? And I, I'm not putting my personal opinion, just saying, you know, like. I think everything should be reviewed. I mean, one of the things I've seen over the last 15 years in legislature is really good analysis of how our taxes are working, how tax expenditures and tax credits are working. They're now in six year cycles for review. It's like, these are policy choices we make to do the work of the state. I think tax policy should be reviewed on a regular basis to make sure it's working as intended and making sure it's fair. That is a valuable conversation to have. I just don't know what that would be at this very moment. I mean, you've got some people who are like, just literally don't like the tax. All I can say is it is dedicated to schools. It was, we solved a 30 year old problem by providing an additional revenue stream for our schools. Now my job as governor is to make sure that money actually gets the outcomes we want because you know you know what's frustrating having taxes that don't actually do what you want them to do in this case we have asked our districts with the student success act dollars to improve graduation rates improve, you know fully fund career and technical education make sure our students have social and emotional supports i'm going to be asking how is that going how are your plans are you getting the outcomes because 
people should know that when their money gets collected, it's actually doing what they want it to do. So that's my job. Whether or not we change it or not, I'm going to make sure we get the outcomes we want. Absolutely. And then, all right, it's a big question coming. It's about it's <laughs> <laughs> it's about Major League Baseball. Here it comes. So, <laughs> oh yeah, it's why this show was created in the first That's place. Why you're <laughs> <laughs> like after Finally. this after this answer, I, I'm leaving. No, well, we we actually have a concerted effort, right? In all seriousness, we, uh, you have the Dimer Project, and and I know mm-hmm. I know them quite well. Full transparency, um, and I know right now they're actually making pretty good headway, even though they're they're oh, not good. publicly talking about it. But you were talking about bringing businesses to Oregon. And if you look at the Diamond Project, yeah, it's about baseball, but it, it really is about development, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, the, their whole plan. And I guess my question, I know we have a little bit of money in there to help fund uh, mm-hmm. a stadium that's, that's been there. Would you go above that to bring in baseball and uh, that type of project into our community, wherever it may go, um, to provide more jobs. Is that something that you'd be willing to to put out? I think I'd really have to see the numbers. My inclination is probably not. I mean, the money to help for bringing in a major league team would have to be, you know, approved by the legislature. Um, you know, I'm so hyper-focused right now on making sure we have enough resources to get more housing built. To me, when it comes down to those kind of decisions, it's like, well, what else do we need to be funding? And I'm always going to put more housing construction at the top of the list because that, to me, is a workforce issue. So I'd be, it would be hard pressed to say we should prioritize that kind of development over housing. But I, you know, I'm always open to it. But it, just for you know, full disclosure, I played little league baseball. I'm throwing out the ball at the hops game here in a couple of weeks. So the first first pitch, I like baseball, um, and. But it has to be a project that has multiple benefits, not just, you know, jobs that are connected to the gate. Right. I, right. I, I think that's good. And, and to be fair, they're not asking for public funding. It was just a personal, you know, I wonder. Mm-hmm. Because I know it's out there. Though. Right. Yeah. Like, like, for example, I mean, the amount of tax revenue the visiting players would have to pay. I mean, that's the different. You, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Where it may mm-hmm. give you more arrows in your quiver to be able to, to help with housing or whatever. Right. Whatever. And, and so I've always looked at that. And, and as a private business owner, I know if the private sector is willing to go fund something on their own without asking, there's a reason. And and so that reason usually comes down to money. And I look at that. And I'm like, well, if they they know there's money there. Right. And if you know, that's why I, why I ask you the question is, can that not help pay for those services that we see other cities? They have that luxury. Um, from MLB. NBA is not the same way, right? It's a little bit different, right. the setup. So that's mm-hmm. why I brought I, that. I will always say is I will look at the numbers. I'm, I'm always like, show me the numbers, right? And then if the numbers are I worth think, they, sh- you know, you know, yeah, right? I, but I it's think we need to keep in yeah. touch. Well, some kind yeah. of partnership <laughs> possibility because it would generate revenue right. in other yeah. areas as well. So, you know, depending well, on the Well, that's the thing. So part- it should be part of a comprehensive plan yeah. wherever they end up citing it. And and what I had seen early on was uh, commitments to local construction jobs, hire. I'm like, I think when you have that complete package of overall community benefits, then it's a lot more appealing. And, and they, I think and that that's have, where they're going with that conversation, yep. which is, you know, where they yeah. should be. They have the union, uh, excuse me, the unions, you know, mm-hmm. that they're willing to use and which I, th- I think is 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 yeah. big considering on, you know, uh, commercial unions are, are big here, right? Plumbers, mm-hmm. electricians, all that. So yeah. I think that would be good. Yeah, definitely yeah. to, to uh, form those partnerships. And just a little bit on, mm-hmm. on that same topic um, in regard to the Diamond Project, but other partnerships, um, you know, are we looking at those now or is that something that's on the horizon? We went through this couple of years of flux where nothing's been happening. So are, mm-hmm. are we looking forward now to those types of things or are those not on the table because we've got our uh, we've got our other issues to deal with first? Well, for me, I think the biggest public private partnership out of the gate when I'm if I have the opportunity to be elected is is really working on housing. You know, most housing, it's a public good, but basically done by the private sector. We're going to have to have deep involvement from the private sector to see new construction in this in the state at the level that we need it. 
And so you'll see my housing plan on day one, doing an executive order to set up the discussion to see how we build 36,000 units per year for the next decade. That's what it's going to take. That would be tripling what we do now. Yeah. So that is that. It's you ambitious. can't do that without the private sector. So it right. is ripe for a really good partnership. Absolutely. Okay. All right, moving to um, mining lithium in Oregon. I've got to ask this question because okay, well, I know Do you like that. I'm just you know I'm a little hyperactive. I didn't take my Ritalin. It's coming at you, Tina. Here it comes. Yeah. So I'm um, like I already you already broke my heart on baseball. Okay. So we're <laughs> no how you know there was an article came out about lithium mining or in mm-hmm. in Oregon, and is it's interesting because I don't know that a lot of people understand. Oregon has a very large deposit of lithium, which makes our batteries for cars, right? It's pretty critical, pretty critical thing. Right. Yep. Mm-hmm. Pretty critical. So do you support mining lithium in Oregon? That is a really good question. Um, so first of all, we need to have more lithium in the United States. I think for the mines that are being suggested in East Oregon, right? Isn't it like Southeast Oregon where the, yeah, the mines are being projected? Of- California, Nevada, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah it's a very yeah. beautiful kind of. and, and somewhat far away place in the, right. um, on the Idaho Nevada border. Um, I think what we need to make sure is when we consider that permitting is making sure there are two big issues for me. Um, it's really important to protect and respect whatever impact that it might have on um, uh, historically tribal lands, you know, making sure our Native American tribes are consulted and considered the transparency of that is very, very important to me. That's just that's just kind of a personal public issue for me. The other issue on lithium is my understanding it takes a lot of water to process. So one of the questions I would ask this governor is, what's the impact of the lithium mining on existing water resources and things like that um, because we're in drought and things like that. So I think it's not a yes or no. It's a, let's make sure the process is right. Let's make sure we ask the good questions and there is a public benefit to having lithium. Can we do it in Oregon? Can we get it right? It's going to be a challenge, but you know, what's fun about public policy is every, when it's complex like that, it makes it really interesting. So we'll have to figure it out. Well, and I, I, in one of the articles I was reading the mining of lithium they were saying is actually dirtier for the environment than the mining of or drilling of oil. And that oh, wow. uh, it, now again, that's an article. Um, it didn't seem like that was coming from a uh, far right or left or like there, it just, this is what it is. So, you know, to well, me, extraction, that's extraction industries are not, right. they're not easy that's, and they have environmental impact. The question right. is, is it's, can you balance the good with the impact? I, right. I don't know. And that, right, that's the crazy thing, you know, for me is like the one thing, okay, a battery may be dirtier than just, you know, drilling the oil. Okay, a hard, hard thing. That That is a tough question. I had to throw that at you. I mean, come on now. No, that's good. Right. It's, it's going to yeah. come up, right? Because we just, right. remember just a couple years ago, we were going to get rid of uh, the agency that actually deals with these permits. Dogami, the yeah. Department of Oregon of Geology and Mineral Industries, I think it's the, mm-hmm. yeah, so... But we still have Dogami, right? And so who's in charge here? And um, so it's we got to make sure we run a good process. And I think they're just at the start of their permitting. So it's, yep. I'm sure it's going to come up. It's going to take a while. <laughs> None of these, I mean, that's a, that's a, that permitting is not simple. I'm no, sure. so. no I, I would imagine that's not. And it is in that corner of Oregon. Like you, yeah, you're way not over even, there. You're yeah, way. <laughs> kind of reminds me of the, the corner of my back closet. I'm like, oh, what's back here? You know, I mean, anyways. Um, so, all right. Some tougher questions. And, uh, you know, I've got to ask because we've never met. This is our first time meeting, right? And so I've read, you know, we're all on social media and a lot of people I see are talking, you know, when they talk about what you would do for Oregon, they're like, yeah, that's, they, they call it, I believe, Kate 2.0, which mm-hmm. I wanted to ask you that because I've never seen you respond to it, right? Like mm-hmm. one way or the other. And so I have to ask because, you know, in your, how are you different? then I want to give you this opportunity to, especially business owners, because they, you know, we can be emotional, you know, just go down and, and I get that. That's because of business is emotion, right? I mean, I don't care who you're you are. You're putting your, your right. heart and soul into something. And yeah, absolutely. Every time you go to bed, all of your employees 
you 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 take that with you the decisions mm-hmm. you make and so we are i that is true yeah so with that said what do you say to those that say you're a second coming of kate brown <laughs> The second coming, that's a little bit too Right, there you go. I literally had that said to me earlier, and I was like, really? Well, I, I want to give you a K2 Dotto. I want to give you the an opportunity for you to, right. to because you, you and I both know that her, the poll that just came out, she was at a, a, a 20, 27% favorability. I, I, even I was like, that is okay. I mean, that seemed really low, but it is, you know, it's where we are. And so I want to give you this opportunity. Yeah, no, and 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 I and I have seen it. People are saying that. I, you know, honestly, personally, I think it's a convenient talking point to kind of, you know, undermine what my record shows. I, I think voters are going to be very; they'll be able to understand who I am, you know, in the course of this campaign and and who I am as a person. Um, and I believe in being decisive. I believe in bringing people together, being transparent. I think some of the frustration is maybe our current governor hasn't been as, as transparent with business leaders. I'm going to be very transparent about the decision making that we undergo. We're not always going to agree, but I, I'm going to work hard, make sure that I don't promise things I can't do, and really involve as many people as possible to make decisions. I don't, you know, whether that's, too, I think that's just who I am. That's Tina Kotek 1.0. That's what I do. That's what I've done as speaker. And so, you know, I'm one of those people who always looks forward. I don't, you know, we want to learn from the past, but really we're in the moment now that people want to know what we're going to do forward. And what I'm going to do for people is listen and solve problems. And that's who I am. And hopefully they'll see the difference or or not. I don't, I just want them to vote for me because we need to get some things done. And I think I'm the best person to do it. Very good. <laughs> see, you always have to ask the question, whatever you read, you know, that's, <laughs> that's why. Um, mm-hmm. All right. Finally, I think we're getting to the finally uh, very important. Do okay. you do you think a hot dog is a sandwich? Didn't Absolutely. see that coming. <laughs> Absolutely. So you're not even asking what my favorite hot dog is. Are no. you? I'm a big hot dog. No, no. Now think about it. You got meat and you have bread. Is it a sandwich? sandwich. It's a sandwich. I it's agree. It's not its own category. <laughs> I mean, think about it. Do you put mayo on a hot dog? I don't know, but you can on a sandwich. Some people do. Some people do. I don't. No, no, no. Some That's, people do. No. I'm, I, well, here, here's the thing oh, that you should know about me. Is, is that after COVID when you lost your I, taste I put pickle relish. I put pickle relish on my sandwiches. Well, I can. I, look. So I think, I, you know. I can get there with the pickle relish. Right. But mayo going on a hot dog. I know. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, that's a. All right. But I, you know, there's some people who think ranch goes on everything. I don't get right. that. I think that's, I have never, never embraced the ranch. No. So, you know, I. No. I yeah. mean, I like ranch in moderation. I mean, I know that <laughs> may, may look like I, I don't, but I, it's moderation, you know, on the, okay. on the ranch. I, I'll have to believe uh, you on that. I think so. we're, so you've gotten three people now. To I say, am in agreement with you. I believe yeah. it's a sandwich. Uh, I, I don't like mayonnaise, so I, w- I don't put mayonnaise on anything. So that wouldn't matter to me one way or the right. other. I don't think it's about the condiments. It's Correct. the basic. So if we categorize it, it's a meat with a bread product. Right. That's a sandwich. Yes. So it is a, a sandwich. A different shaped bread par- product. It has its own category of bread. Mm. Oh. So how about, so uh, boy, I'm going to, re- you know, how about, uh, you know, a banh mi, like a Vietnamese sandwich. Mm-hmm. So that is a long, you know. That's a longish bun. That's a sandwich. Drat, you got me. <laughs> like it's that. not a. It is not a corn dog. So it is not, well, we, now corn dog is not a sandwich. There okay, you go. So corn go- <laughs> Wait, but it's got bread around it, even though it's on a stick. All right. True. Uh, I, it's on a I, stick. You know, and I think I think the question is, corn dog, yes or no? I think uh, I don't get corn dogs. I don't. Now my <laughs> wife really likes a corn dog, but I'm just like no. The corn dog, but, but not, a hot dog, absolutely any day, any day of the week. Yeah, she doesn't like the corn dogs that come in a box that are frozen. I mean, you know, what, what are those? You know what I'm talking about? That yes, <laughs> if you don't microwave it just right, that's not good. So you gotta you gotta do it in the oven. You gotta get that. So going. I'm go- I'm really gonna push this question because you know what the other thing I like is uh, pizza in a blanket, right? So the oh, little weed right. with the uh, right the, the yeah. around it, right? That's not is that a sandwich? Hmm. 
That's a hot dog. I don't. That's yeah, a I little don't hot dog. I don't think that's a sandwich. That's a I know. It's a dog. Mi- I know. That's I mean, a really right. It's right. not a bread. It's like a pastry. Right. So I mean, this is this is inquiring minds want to know. Yes. I think you're. Is pig in the blanket? Are the little mini pigs in the blanket? Is that a sandwich? Look, I don't know. In your next debate, unfortunately, <laughs> this is going to come up in your head. You're and you're going to start thinking about it, right? And, you know, I need you to bring this question up. You know, if you debate Tobias, go look, Tobias. <laughs> you know, I'm going to do this for you, Stephen, because we do get those questions in debates. Like, you get to ask your opponent a question. So I will, I will, you know, I know Tobias, I think, has been on, so I'll have to ask him. Yeah. So, no. mini pigs in a blanket. Right. Damn, right. once you're not. Right. I'll, you know, I, I promise to ask. Him. All right. Well, and make sure to let him know, you know, maybe <laughs> after that, you know, that came from here. You know, there you go. Yeah, you'll be hearing from him. You're like, thanks a lot, Stephen. Yeah, yeah he, he, he will. Yeah. Right, um, exactly. Is there anything else regarding Oregon business? I think we've covered uh, most of it that you would, you know, that you're thinking about that you want people to know. I, I think the, well, the last thought I would leave is I have a lot of respect for folks who invest their personal finances, their time, their energy into creating businesses that employ people. I think it's really important. And small, medium, or large companies, there's a real commitment there. What I'm mostly looking for as next governor is those employers who um, are really committed to Oregon, are really committed to treating their workers well, because I think there's always a spot at the table for people who want to help move the state forward. Um, And I just want people to know my door will be open to folks who want to solve problems together. That's what I'm about. Some people are just like, they want to throw things. They don't want to solve problems. That's fine. But what I want are folks who want to get, you know, get in the midst of things and figure stuff out because that's what we need to do right now. I look forward to those conversations with anybody who wants to have. Very good. Thank you, Tina, for joining us today. We really appreciate your time and good luck. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. You have a good one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, as always, for checking out DMG's Bootstraps and Business. If you'd like to find out more about our guests, DMG, or these podcasts, just check out the show notes. Thank you.